threes. A proud barbarian in a loincloth, he arrogantly mocked his opponents, provoked fans, and the entire boxing establishment, opposing himself to the established boxing traditions of Britain. Hamid's entrances to the ring were standalone showpieces. He flew into the ring on a carpet plane, ascended on an elevator, drove in a car, emerged from a hole in the wall of a model temple, he was carried in on a throne. Dramatically appearing in his trademark leopard print shorts, he somersaulted over ropes, landing in the ring, his natural element. And this was just the beginning, the celebration before the cruel punishment of anyone who stood in his way. This is the story of Nassim Hamid, known as the Prince, one of the most vibrant, controversial, charismatic, and great featherweights in the history of boxing. So be sure to watch this video till the end and don't forget to hit the like button. Nassim Salam Ali Hamid was born on February 12, 1974, in Sheffield, Yorkshire, United Kingdom. His parents hailed from Yemen. Consequently, the Hamid family did not escape discrimination from local nationalists in Sheffield. I always knew that I wanted to be something outstanding. I didn't know what it was going to be at that time. You, you, never, you never do know at the age of seven or whatever, but I always knew that I wanted to be totally different um, and just a big success. Just a very big success, but I never knew exactly what it was going to be until I walked in that gym. Um, and I knew it was a sport for me. He didn't train and everything came easily. A typical myth about any talented boxer. Just like in any other case, this is untrue. The boy's father took him to Brendan Ingalls boxing gym when young Nassim was barely seven years old. Rigorous training and Ingalls unique approach turned the slender lad into a genuine prince of featherweight boxing. He's practiced in here seven days a week. It hasn't come easy, he's done it the hard way. He's gone up and down the motorways with a lot of, like a lot of other people, but he's never been out of here. Seven days a week for, for nearly 15, 14, 15 years. Later on, Engel became not just a coach for the lad, but also a mentor and a teacher, shouldering the responsibility for his entire career. I've got the best trainer in the world. Such a great man, I mean, Brendan from an early age, as in from seven training. In 1985 to 86, Nassim Hamid won his first national amateur tournaments in the flyweight division, up to 49 kilograms. Subsequently, he became a national champion multiple times in Britain and frequently reached the finals of prestigious European tournaments. Nassim's amateur record, 62 to five, including 18 wins by knockout. Nassim Hamid made his professional ring debut in April 1992 against Ricky Beard. His first fight was in the bantamweight division, up to 52.2 kilograms. However, even for this category, Hamid was too light, so before the weigh-in, he filled his shorts with lead. Hamid's performance against his opponent Ricky Beard showcased his lack of experience. He took a few hits on the chin in the initial round. However, his unconventional style, looping punches, and sheer power inevitably prevailed. As the first round progressed, he managed to knock Beard down with a swift left-right combination. In the dominant second round, Hamed landed a solid right on Beard's solar plexus. Good shot. Money shot. It's the leverage gets into it, baby. You see, you set everything up. Bang. The air seemed to escape Beard's body. Perhaps, in that moment, as the referee counted to 10, Beard lost the desire to ever step into the ring again. Light young man doing his flips for all to see. <laughs> Star quality. He knew how to put himself center stage 
and reveled in the attention. Afterward, 11 days later, 18-year-old Nassim Hamid defeated Sean Norman in his second professional fight. It was another knockout in the second round. Then Hamid moved up in weight and by the end of 1992, he secured four more victories, three of them by knockout and one by unanimous decision against Andrew Bloomer, Left, got him. And that's it, Miguel Matthews, oh, again, maybe not. Des Gargano, Great body. Oh, and Peter Buckley. On February 24th, 1993, at the Grand Hall, Wembley, Hamid secured his first victory against the fighter Alan Lay, who had a positive fighting record, although short and untested. Knockout in the second round. By March 1994, the Prince had amassed 11 victories, with Peter Buckley being the only opponent unfortunate enough to hear the final bell. I've been training for 13 years now. As an amateur, I've won seven national titles. I beat everybody. I beat the Olympic champion from America. Um, as far as I'm concerned, I think I'm the best out there. And when I get out there, Gary, I will do the business and show the British public what they need to see. His 11th win came against the Belgian champion John Maselli, whom he knocked out in the first round of the bout. But uh, when he decides it's time to throw solid shots, he can set himself all right. I think the main thing about him, Reg, is not oh, a bunch of it to Hamid. It's a decent... Oh, dear. Oh, I'm aiming to be a legend. A legend. Let's let's forget the world titles. Well, three world titles that'll do me. But I'm aiming to be a legend, and I will be. And I'm the prince that shall be king. This victory paved the way for the self-proclaimed 20-year-old prince to vie for the European bantamweight title against the then 33-year-old Italian champion Vincenzo Belcastro. At the very start of the round, 20-year-old Hamid sent Bel Castro to the canvas with a lightning-fast attack. In the fifth round, the Italian found himself in another knockdown, which, however, the referee decided not to count. In the 11th segment of the fight, Vincenzo fell again, and despite clearly losing the fight, he courageously held on and fought until the end. In the final round, the fighters merely taunted each other, hardly landing any punches. Ultimately, Nassim Hamid celebrated a convincing victory and claimed the European title. Naz defended his newly won European bantamweight crown on the August 17, 1994 against Antonio Picardi in which Naz displayed his now usual devastating punching power when he put his opponent on the floor twice before he finally stayed there in the third round. cannot be beat in the way I'm the way I am the way I've been brought up my religion my self-belief the way the way basically God is in my heart and you know so it, it is everything about uh, the positive mental attitude that I've got inside you know the Brit continued his bright victorious ascent towards the pinnacle of professional boxing 
Two months later, Nez moved into the super bantamweight division to compete for the vacant WBC international title, which he clinched by defeating Freddy Cruz, landing hard hits and stopping him in the sixth round. His first title defense took place against the previously undefeated opponent, Loriano Ramirez from the Dominican Republic. Hamid dominated Ramirez with quick invisible like punches. Ramirez got slept in the final minute of the third round. On January 21st, 1995, he entered the ring against the 31-year-old Mexican, Armando Castro. Hamid initiated the fight without any reconnaissance, peppering the Mexican almost at will. Castro tried to get closer and lure his opponent in, looking to counter, but he was seriously outpaced. He hit the canvas in the second round, yet for some reason, the referee didn't count it as a knockdown. By the fourth round, Hamed had dropped Castro twice more, prompting the referee to halt the beating. Hamid's popularity grew, his unorthodox style winning a large fan base and his boxing antics generating a large group of detractors. After signing for Frank Warren, Hamid, employing more spectacular entrances, knocked out better opposition in Enrique Angeles and Juan Polo Perez, both within two rounds. There are not enough superlatives in the English Yemeni Japanese dictionaries to describe you as a boxer. I just don't know what to say. When I say I'm supreme, people just laugh. Now, what are they going to say when I become world champion? That was a beautiful workout. Oh, baby, I'm feeling so good. On September 30th, Hamid stepped into his first fight for a full title against champion Steve Robinson. At that time, the 26-year-old Robinson had successfully defended his WBO belt in the featherweight division seven times. Nassim started the fight traditionally aggressive, establishing his range right from the outset. The champion, however, was defensively sound, disciplined in his approach against the southpaw. 
chances. Hamid's incredible speed, reflexes, and timings allowed him to land freely on his opponent, taunting him in the process while avoiding retaliation. To the, floor. the latter part of the second round was highly paced and genuinely gripping. Very confident time after time, Hamid managed to outmaneuver and frustrate his esteemed opponent. He's trying to goad him into coming out of that defensive shell, and he's managed to do that, I think. Now Hamid's trying to open up and look at what he's really taking chances in there. By the middle of the fifth round, Steve Robinson found himself knocked down. There. He doesn't know what he's got to do. In the way of boxing ability. He's probably lost every round while the first. And Hamad here is going for the finish, I think. Punch flooded in. In the middle of the eighth, the referee stopped the fight. You know, I've told you before, Gary, when I hit them, I'm not making a song and dance about it, but believe it. They just can't take the punishment, they can't take the power. The power is extraordinary, and I'll keep saying extraordinary. It's, I'm blessed from God, what can I say? It's a gift. It's worth noting that this bout wouldn't leave any boxing enthusiast indifferent. In his 20th professional fight, Nassim Hamid became a world champion. It was also when he suffered an injury to his hand, a problem that haunted him throughout his career. The new champion had his first title defense in March 1996. Right from the start of the opening round, Hamed sent his opponent to the canvas with his very first strike. Oh my word! Just looking, out it comes, wide punch, bang, perfectly on the chin. The challenger got up but was soon brought back down by a powerful uppercut. One more punch. Exactly. The referee stopped the fight. It took just three hits for the Prince to secure this impressive victory in every sense. It was the fastest title fight ever held in Scotland. It's worth mentioning his second title defense, a vibrant and short bout against Daniel Alicio with mutual knockdowns. At this stage of his career, Nassim fought mainly in the United Kingdom and Ireland. Among his opponents were former world champions, sturdy contenders, and prospects with an unblemished record. In August 1996, he faced quite a challenging test. Nassim's opponent for his third title defense was Manuel Medina. This Mexican had already fought in about 60 professional bouts and twice held the world title in the super featherweight division. In the entirety of his rich career, he would become a five-time champion of that weight class. Featherweight championship of the world. You notice right away he's a southpaw, jabbing with that right Right from the start, the Mexican aimed to show that he was on par with Hamid. say that he walks into a left hand, but look at the way he leaned either way. He leans away from the guys, very awkward. He moved a lot, worked with his lead hand, and disturbed Nassim's rhythm. At the end of the second round, Medina was counted for a knockdown from a leaping left. Surprisingly, after hitting the canvas, Manuel Medina became more effective than before and won several middle rounds in a row. Medina 
In the first minute of the ninth round, the Mexican found himself on the canvas again, having received a precise straight right from the Briton. A similar situation occurred at the end of the round, a knockdown from a right straight. Toward the end of the 11th round, Nassim shook Medina several times. And before the 12th, the doctor advised the referee to stop the fight, which he did. After the fight, Nassim admitted that it wasn't his best performance, attributing it to having caught the flu the day before. On February 8, 1997, Hamid faced the American Tom Boom Boom Johnson in a unification bout. Tom was 10 years older than Hamid. He had held the IBF title in the super featherweight division for four years and already completed 11 successful defenses. The beginning of the match primarily unfolded at a distance where the Prince excelled in precision over his opponent. Hamid's incredible speed and reactions nullified Johnson's attempts to step in or time his shots effectively. At the end of the third round, Nassim managed to shake Johnson, but the latter endured. However, towards the end of that same round, Hamid himself was caught by a right-hand counter and briefly touched the canvas with his glove, though the referee didn't notice. By the end of the seventh round, Nez once again rocked Tom Johnson, but the bell saved him. In the following eighth round, after a prolonged assault by the Prince, the American finally hit the canvas. Johnson got up, but the referee, seeing his condition, called off the fight. On the other side of the Atlantic, people have not been convinced about you. What do you say to them now? The Prince, at the age of 22, good looking boy, came along and take it off him uh, in his fight in his fifth defense. And what can I say? You're looking at a legend soon to be, I mean, there's time to prove but I'm going to prove it and I'm going to do it and bring it back to Britain. Hamid made several more quick defenses, including defeating his compatriot, British and Commonwealth champion Billy Hardy. Before the fight, Hardy stated that Hamid may ride into the ring in a chariot, but he will leave on a stretcher. Nassim predicted that he would win by knockout in the first round. Hardy was stopped in 93 seconds. I've ever seen. Forward. Once again, he's got it. He actually got up at seven. And he's got him again. Billy Hardy got the goal. It's all over. So, a two knockout. Hamid soon vacated the IBF title, having problems with his mandatory defense. He's working almost exclusively with jabs. And he does have a smile. In general, 1997 was a particularly shocking year for Hamid. 
In total, he spent five fights, sometimes entering the ring two months after the previous one. So it happened with the fight against Kevin Kelly. Prior to his U.S. debut, on October 11th in Sheffield, Prince knocked out Puerto Rican Jose Badillo in the seventh round. Lined up next was a bout with America's Kevin Kelly in New York before the end of the year. Kevin Kelly's here tonight and he's seen, he's seen the skill of the Prince and the strength and the ability and the accuracy and the speed. Oh gosh, you know I'm the best in the world. Kelly was in Sheffield on this night to watch the Prince and interrupted his post-fight interview. He's right here in front of me and I can honestly tell him that I'm going to knock him spark out. Immediately after, it was announced that he would fight Kelly on December 19th at Madison Square Garden. But the promotion of the duel itself, of course, began much earlier. Her start was made in one of the interviews, when Hamid, in his usual manner, admitted that he would deal with Kelly as convincingly as with everyone else before him. I could take Kevin Kelly to my backyard and beat him up there, but I don't want to do that. I'd rather do it in his backyard. Kelly only said that Hamid would answer for his words in the ring. I'll shut the mouth of this talker in the first round. Kelly was the perfect candidate for Hamid's U.S. debut. He went into the fight with a record of 47 to 1, 31 wins by knockout. He owned the WBC world title, but in January 1995, he quite unexpectedly lost to the Mexican Alejandro Gonzalez. Kevin, as well as Hamid, had serious knockout abilities, so the fans logically expected the maximum spectacle from the fight on December 19th. Yeah, we got a deal. Let's do it. You know, I'm a warrior. Look in I your eyes. It. Let's do it. You know I love that. Let's do it. I'm a real New Yorker. I can't wait to do it. Wasteland Don't Warrior, baby. I'm from the Wasteland. I know I'm not going to run. you're going to run. Run? Yeah. <laughs> you have Mr. Vaughn home. I'm talking run. You tell your brother. He knows the Vaughn. You know. At the final press conference before the fight, the fighters continued to exchange plans for the fight and promised to knock each other out. One big difference that the media has missed. He hits them, they get up. When I hit them, they unconscious. There's a big difference between my punching power and my rockets compared to his rockets. He got missiles. I got nitrogen bombs. If you were that quality of a fighter, that everybody will snap you up. But you ain't got anything. Yo, I've been the black sheep. Simple fight. reason. Marvin Hagler. You ain't Prince. I am the black sheep. You ain't Prince the same. And after this fight, listen, I'm gonna like trying to create a nice job for you, putting my posters up with HBO. <laughs> when I hit him in the first round, the first round, he's gonna feel sorry that he ever thought about the third round. He's gonna feel it. I'm telling. Knock me out. Nobody can knock me out. Nobody has ever knocked me out. And you're not the first they're going to try to do it and said they're going to do it. When I hit you, this bottle, that's how you're going to fall. I'm the hardest puncher you've ever been in the ring with. You're not the hardest puncher featherweight. I got news for you. I am. I got more knockouts than you got fights. When I hit you with the first punch, you're going to know what the time it is. I know you switch lefty, switch righty and all that. So do I. I got the dipsy doodle too. I do all that. And then came the long-awaited evening of boxing. The Prince was so carried away by the finest hour that he completely lost track of time. His total entry into the ring lasted almost 10 minutes, causing genuine irritation in Kelly, who urged his opponent to stop dancing and start fighting. And there was a reason. Kelly approached the fight with extreme motivation against the favorite. He's at a disadvantage. And that's what happened, Kelly. The Prince started as usual, boxing with his hands down, playing for the public, neglecting defense in every possible way, and relying only on his own striking power. Nassim clearly underestimated his opponent for which he paid already at the start. The boxers looked at each other for a minute, and before the end of the round, they made a real felling. Hamid pinned the opponent in the corner, but after the attack he opened under the most powerful right hook in the jaw. Nassim was on the canvas for only the second time in his career. Second time in his career, he's been down in the first round. The second round was a real decoration of the fight. The events here developed at lightning speed. 
After only 40 seconds, Kelly struck first the right hook and then the left straight Hamid touched the floor of the ring with his glove. What could happen would be that the prince was exposed as a fraud. His gloves touched the canvas. The count At this point, the referee Benji Estevez was supposed to intervene, but simply did not have time. The prince quickly stood up and received a right blow to the head, touching the canvas again. Yeah, I think the last knockdown was fluke. Kelly was down. But to their happiness, Nassim not only quickly recovered, but before the end of the round, he more than returned the favor to Kelly, twice sending the opponent to knockdowns. As yet. I think the mistake he made. There we go. Right right there. Spectators in the arena watched a real war, and even though Kelly was knocked down, the favorite defended to everyone's shock. The more Nassim decided to be orthodox. At that moment, one could only imagine how the HBO bosses felt when they signed a multi-million dollar contract with the British. Get the rhythm to Kelly. To close, having seen knockdowns for each. The third round is the only one in the fight where there were no knockdowns, but there was definitely no less fighting there than in the previous two trying to get away from punches takes a hard left and lands kelly knocked down of hamed in round two now kevin starting to again kelly worked from a position of strength throwing significantly more punches and he confidently took the round and in general looked preferable that's another thing phil borgia said he said my man through kelly's guard they trade right hands kevin's was the harder of the two good left up until the middle of the fourth segment, Kelly, if not dominant, then definitely interrupted the favorite. He lands a hard left hand. Kelly misses with the right and misses wildly. All the more unexpected was the left hook performed by Hamid, and this time Kevin was in serious condition. But taking some leather in return. Down goes Kelly on two hard left hands. Nassim rushed to finish off. But in the exchange, he again missed Kelly's blow, touching the floor with his glove. Kelly a little slow to respond here. You gotta be careful mixing up with Kelly because he can fight. And that's gonna be Kelly rushed at the opponent, already completely forgetting about the defense and the fact that he was against the most striking boxer in the division. In the exchange, Nassim found a moment and threw a powerful left hook into the temple area. Love grazes the canvas. The referee is within his rights to rule it a knockdown, and Benji Estevez did. And wow. then that. Kelly got up before the referee counted, but was too shocked, and the referee stopped the fight. The prince epically burst into the American ring and successfully worked out his contract. Surprisingly, the rematch was not organized then, although Kelly really wanted to. Hamid's milestone. 10th title defense took place in April 1998. His opponent was the experienced Puerto Rican idol, Wilfredo Vasquez. Nassim Hamid confidently controlled the fight from its outset. In the third round, Vasquez went down from a left punch. He hit the canvas again in the sixth round. In the seventh round, Hamid secured another knockdown. A lot. Oh, that Followed by one more in the final minute. The beating was logically halted. Unfortunately, the more successful Nassim Hamid became, the less he trained. He worked more as an amateur than as a professional.
Nassim's next fight took place again in the United States. His challenger was Wayne Pocket Rocket McCullough. McCullough was a renowned Irish fighter, having won silver in the 1992 Olympics and becoming a professional champion. Notably, he was known for his sturdy chin. Throughout his entire professional career, he had never been knocked down. There was a history between the fighters, with numerous negative mentions of each other in the media. The day before the fight, Hamid declared that he would knock out Wayne in the third round. McCullough was persistent, working effectively, trying to assert himself with volume punches and engaging in rapid combinations at middle distance. However, this did not deter Nassim, who responded fiercely and accurately, his attacks more precise. The contrasting styles ensured an intense fight. Despite McCullough's consistent activity, Nassim was far more effective. In the championship rounds, Wayne increased the pace, but it wasn't enough for victory. Hamid celebrated a convincing win by decision after 12 rounds. This was Nassim's final fight under the guidance of coach Brendan Engel and promoter Frank Warren. Engel had trained the Prince for 16 years, but disagreements had become more frequent in the last three years. The coach mentioned that Hamed's behavior was driving him crazy, citing issues with discipline and the boxer's growing disdain for lengthy training camps. Ultimately, this long-standing partnership between mentor and pupil fell apart. At 25 years old, Nassim was at the pinnacle of his career. His fame and accomplishments were known worldwide, ranking him at number 9 among the best boxers regardless of weight class. The Prince decided to hire a new, far more respected and widely known mentor, Emmanuel Stewart. Nassim's next fight was against his unbeaten and promising compatriot, Paul Engel. Already in the first round, Engel missed two left blows, body head, and was knocked down. A beautiful left hand one to the... He was fairly active, but most of his attacks missed their mark. Shots and he's timing them all. In the sixth round, he found himself on the canvas again, this time from a body shot. Oh, left to the body. While Nassim dominated the first half of the fight, in the latter rounds, Engel found his range. Towards the end of the 10th round, he managed to shake up Naz. At the beginning of the next round, Prince landed a single left hand. Seeing that Paul is getting up with great difficulty, the referee stops the fight. In 2000, the Prince, holding two titles, ranked sixth in the world's best boxers rating. In March of that year, he faced South African Vuyani Bungu, who had long held the IBF title in a lower weight class. And every time he wins, because he knows the right strategy, he needs something spectacular again here. He's a good defensive fighter. Time as well, and Bungu from Hamid is worth fighting. It's a big right hand from Bungu, though. 
The public expected the African to give Nassim a worthy fight, but Nassim Hamid brutally knocked out Bungu with a left hand in the middle of the fourth round and became the first to defeat him ahead of schedule. So very good. Coming hard. Oh, and a big left hand. Goes the middle with the left hand. Look at that. Bang. Level now for years and years and years. And that's the... Following this fight, Hamid attempted to arrange a bout with Juan Manuel Marquez, who had long been the number one contender for his title. Marquez declined, stating he wanted more money. Nassim's 15th WBO title defense took place in the United States. His opponent was 22-year-old American Augie Sanchez. He possessed heavy hitting power and had decent amateur achievements. In the middle of the second round, Sanchez managed to put Hamid down on the canvas, turning the boxer's encounter into a fierce battle from that moment on. At the end of the same second round, Nassim was shocked during one of the exchanges. In the third round, both boxers were on the verge of going down multiple times, and their faces during the break indicated they had not gone through three rounds, but rather a tough 12-round fight. At the end of the following fourth round, Nassim delivered a series of precise blows, leading to a stunning knockout of Augie Sanchez. Sanchez left the ring on a stretcher. During this fight, the prince also injured his hand, requiring surgery. During his recovery, Nassim gained more than 15 kilograms in weight. Nevertheless, he had no plans to defend his WBO title further. Nassim chose a different path and vacated the title. On April 7, 2001, Nassim Hamid stepped into the ring against the Mexican fighter Marco Antonio Barrera, who had long held the WBO title in a lower weight class and had recently engaged in the fight of the year against Eric Morales. All of this made it an appealing bout for Hamid to contest in the United States. Both fighters were 27 years old at the time, and Barrera was considered a 3-to-1 underdog. Nassim's colorful exit was overshadowed by a devastating first round. Barrera obviously watched his opponent's last fight against Augie Sanchez more than once. He stood in his classic balanced stance and punched the same homework a right straight or side into the chest area a smashing left hook to the head. Barrera proved the effectiveness of this combination throughout the fight. The logic is simple. The first blow to the chest area fettered the strongest left hand of the prince, which allowed him to freely break through the left hook. By delivering this series of blows and treating the seam with several accurate jabs, the Mexican took the first round. However, shaking Naz is only half the battle. In the second round, Nassim went ahead, but again ran into Barrera's signature combination. In one of the episodes, the prince dropped the Mexican with a wrestling technique, which made the opponent very angry. But the Briton also shot from the left. Barrera, Barrera holds him by the waist. As Barrera is either pulled down or was Hamed. I have seen that before. Before finally coming into the ring. The third round was a continuation of the second. Oh, 
those left hand shots. I have no particular respect for Nassim's power. He's fighting as though he does. Marco Antonio hit twice with a working combination, and Nassim accurately answered with a front right hand. Herrera lands a jab. It's his reflexes. And he's getting close. A right hand, then followed by a left of the right. <laughs> In the fourth segment, the Mexican again managed to shake the enemy with his left hook and take the round. Very composed, Pereira. That was a hit, but there we see. He hasn't got in one position yet. However, in the fifth round, the pattern completely changed. The tactical game began at a distance. Stronger nerves were at Pereira. Been unsuccessful so far. He hit twice with his signature combination. Having received a thrashing from the steward during the break, Nassim changed his stance. He got right-handed and acted very successfully, winning the sixth round. Still, the Briton could not turn the tide of the battle, spoiled the impression of the local public, which mercilessly shouted at every blow Barrera, creating a false impression of his advantage. It wasn't. But even Nassim could not do anything with the collected and psychologically prepared counterpart. Everything was evenly divided until the 11th round. Moreover, the 10th round of the Prince took his asset. In the 11th round, Barrera activated. He slightly increased the speed and confidently took the round. That the prince has developed since he was a boy is being exposed, George. There is, but not when he's running. Like the prince into the ropes. They're three minutes away from the conclusion. And the twelfth became a real benefit of the Mexican. One oh three, seven rounds to four. Marco is for this. Stand away from taking that advice. He's going for it. He's he made the opponent miss. Barrera punched accurately, but completely spoiled the impression with a police wrestling technique, grabbing Nassim's hand and hitting his opponent on the ring post. Joe Cortez, quite rightly, deducted one point from him. But even this did not save Nassim. He lost the fight. Lost tactically. He himself understood this. All three judges ruled in favor of Barrera, 116 to 111, 115 to 112 twice. There was no defeat, about which the haters of Nassim are so fond of trumpeting, here was not even close. The possibility of rematch was spelled out in the contract. The desire was expressed by Nassim himself, explaining the unsuccessful performance by an injury to both hands. But the boxing world was never destined to see the second fight of two great boxers. Nassim had only one more fight against a rather average Spaniard Manuel Calvo. He ended his career at the age of 28. He didn't break. Nassim started too early and his early retirement had nothing to do with the loss to Barrera. This was noted by the British champion himself. The time has come. He couldn't train as hard as he did in his younger days and made the right decision. 
Throughout his 10-year professional career, he defeated 10 boxers who went on to become world champions. Nassim's professional record stands at 36 to 1, with 31 knockouts. The Ring magazine ranked him 11th among the greatest British boxers of all time and 46th among the greatest punchers of all time. In 2015, Nassim Hamid was inducted into the International Boxing Hall of Fame. Boxing was huge in the 90s, possibly more than ever before or since. Besides Iron Mike, Prince Nassim was arguably the biggest character in all of that. There was something so quintessentially British about him. That's the story of the career of the most entertaining boxer in history.